Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, The Loyalty Iceberg, Creating Human-Centered Experiences, presented by NCR Corporation and hosted by FastCasual.com. I'm Andy Detweiler. I'm the Managing Editor for NetWorld Media Group and the Site Editor for QSR Web and Pizza Marketplace. I'll introduce our speakers in a moment, but first I'd like to remind everyone to stick around for the entire presentation because at the end, you'll be able to submit a question and possibly have it answered during our question and answer portion of the webinar. So today we'll learn new and better ways to utilize customer loyalty programs. Sure, you can gather emails and send out e-blasts to the masses, but what if you could look beyond traditional loyalty programs, which are just the tip of the iceberg? The customer experience has to be about more than just the transactional cycle of spending money to earn rewards just to spend more money. Teaching you how today is Catherine Saab, Product Manager of Consumer Marketing for NCR Corporation and Andy O'Dell, Chief Strategy Officer for Clutch. Catherine manages the product strategy, development, and roadmaps for the consumer marketing solution within NCR's hospitality division. Andy is a founder at Clutch, a customer data and marketing platform, and leads strategy, sales, partnerships, marketing, and thought leadership. With that, I'll hand it over to Catherine and Andy. Thank you, Mandy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, we're really excited to get into the loyalty iceberg and talk about creating human-centered experiences. Um, without further ado, I'll jump right in. Um, so to begin by setting the stage a little bit, we understand that 78% of consumers expect personalized experiences. Um, you know, experience economy requires businesses to orchestrate personalized and memorable events for their consumers. But today, only 16% of companies can deliver on this. Um, so half of all consumers would leave a brand if they're not treated as a recognized guest. So if you collect data on me, I expect something in return. Um, and those expectations today require technology that will help to optimize these experiences for them. So when we take a look at the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg is what we think of as traditional loyalty programs. So it's your spend X, get Y, whether that's points or visits, um, you're spending a certain amount and getting some dollar or discount incentive in return. It's very transactional in nature. Um, you may have given your email address or your phone number. Um, the brand recognizes you and may send out offers sort of en masse, uh, hoping that you spend more. Um, and this can make an impact, you know, not to downplay it. We do see 12 to 18 percent higher sales with loyalty members than non-loyalty. But these programs are very much a one size fits all um, and they don't necessarily drive that true brand loyalty. So we need to understand the customer better and help them and to help them understand the brand. And that's how true loyalty can become really powerful. And it's built in a really authentic way. Um, but the beginning of this starts with recognizing each guest as an individual and then seeing that guest not as a transaction, but as a person and tailoring the experience to them. So today we're going to talk about how to get beyond the surface and that transactional loyalty into more of a, a, a in past the spend based loyalty into more of a human centered experience. So the first component of this. Um, nearly half of customers, again, will abandon a brand if they're not treated as a recognized guest. And so we know inherent in customer service principles is acknowledgement of our individual identities. So if someone calls me by my name, it's a bit more powerful. Um, but also beyond that, knowing where I am. You know, am I near your location? Do I get a push notification when I'm near or at your location with an offer or a reminder? Um, something that's going to make you top of mind for me. Proximity can be a really powerful driver, but also where I've been. So if I order online, know my journey and sort of build on that. Um, if I have points and I'm, I'm a loyal um, you know, frequenter, encourage me to use those points. But also then after the fact, sort of saying thank you or rewarding members for interacting, perhaps providing an opportunity for them to give feedback. And these are all important for recognizing. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting call out because you know at the end of the day, we're individuals, we're people. And recognition is a big part of our own personal identity. And mm -hmm. To your point, it's it's a really powerful emotional driver, and you know, just a simple thank you goes a really long way. You know, there are companies that have built their entire culture, and their a lot of their success is derived from that personal experience. And I think Chick Fil A is a great example, one of my personal favorites. You get some of that southern comfort, some of that southern charm that comes through in a very fast paced transaction. Right, you're in and out of there really, really quick. Great experience, and you just kind of leave a little bit happier. And that can have a massive impact on what it feels to be a human in a business environment like that. And I think, you know, just simple recognition of, hey, how's your day? Yeah. Right. Those little nuances, I think, can really drive 
lowercase loyalty, which is that emotion that we as people have towards brands that we love, whether there's a published loyalty program or an offer or a discount, I love them and they make me, uh, they make it easier for me to love them back when they're, you know, recognizing me as a person. Exactly. Which creates that sort of remembering that brand better and keeping it top of mind. Totally. You look forward to it. Yep. Second component, uh, understanding me. So it's one thing to recognize, but understanding is going to require more data and analysis. Um, Segmenting customers based on their habits can enable more effective targeted marketing. So if say you start with personas, you know, what group or type would I belong to? Am I vegan? Am I a weekend diner? Um, Am I a mobile only shopper? Do I frequent in store, but you know, none of the other channels I'm starting there, but really ending with a person. So how do I then differ? What are my habits, my preferences, my behaviors that make me different? You know, do I respond better to buy gets than discounts? Do I only respond on certain days of the week to offers? Do I prefer a maximum of one communication per week? Um, So so these are all just examples. Um, But if we take a sample segment, let's say off-premise consumers, um, roughly 60% of US consumers order takeout at least once a week. Um, And online ordering is projected to reach 28 billion in sales by next year. So are we tracking and understanding those various segments and their individual preferences? And are we capitalizing on them or missing opportunities there? So continuing to track uh, behaviors and how they change over time, right? And ask for feedback, right? Build on the data, learn from their experiences and their actions. And the understanding piece, I think, really sets up a lot of your other marketing strategies, right? You know, I am a lot of systems, a lot of technology, a lot of CRM. It's it's kind of a Polaroid picture of who I am. And I, I must always be that person forever. But the reality is we all change. And I think the pandemic really kind of exposed unforeseen change, you know, dietary preferences can change, you know, truth, hopefully not too much information, but I, I was plant-based prior to COVID. I was really focused on my health and my well-being. But then when COVID came along, my dietary preferences changed to a very typical diet. And um, that change is drastic for me, but un- invisible to a lot of retailers or a lot of brands that are trying to promote or engage me if you're serving me up imagery of, you know, salads and you miss the opportunity to sell me a steak, that's a big miss. So the understanding piece of the puzzle here isn't a point in time. It's, it's, it's a, a movie. It's this longitudinal view of all the things I'm doing in sequence. So I, I think the understanding piece is, is something that's perpetual. It's not a one-time event. And then embrace me. Um, So 68 consumers will leave a brand if they feel like they don't care about their business. So we need to ask ourselves, are are all of the stakeholders, you know, our company's technology leaders, marketing leaders, operations leaders, is everyone aligned on a customer focused strategy? You know, are we making the right investments? Are we pulling the right levers? Um, These are all, you know, considerations. And then also, are we listening to the customer's needs? Are we communicating not only our efforts, but our mission statement and our values? Um, Do they understand us as a brand? And are we involving them in that conversation? Um, So for detractors of our brand, you know, are we inviting feedback? Are we responding to unmet needs? Do we have a way to track an action based on that feedback? Um, Because, you know, we notice as operators, there are trends that we need to sort of follow that would lend a lot of value to certain offers. Um, So, you know, if we're seeing larger average size orders on premise versus online, how do we incentivize those folks to come into the store more often? How do we make them feel valued when they are there? Um, So all of these ways of trying to reach out and really embrace the consumer. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of brands that are doing really well with some of these concepts of uh, embracing, which is kind of building off of the idea of first, you need to identify me, then you understand me, then you can start to embrace me as part of a company-wide strategy, you know, that's typically marketing led, you know, and there's lots of strategies of how you could leverage that in your own, in the likeness of your own brand. I think REI, which is a retailer, I'm an outdoor enthusiast. So I think they do a really good job of having the idea of a membership that's required to shop there Mm -hmm. without creating a lot of friction or a barrier to shopping. It's, I think, a really interesting approach to making me feel like I'm part of an exclusive group without costing me extra money, but um, still making me feel like I'm part of something. And and as people, as as humans, you know, thinking about human centeredness here. We want to feel connected. We want to feel a part of, especially those brands that, that we love. Um, you know, Chick-fil-A does another, uh, it also does a really great job of having 
a customer focus. Again, nobody is a stranger when you pull up or or walk into a Chick-fil-A and, and they, they spend a lot of time and effort around creating that culture, that experience. Um, but they also communicate a lot about you know, the products that they sell. And, and I think for those that are health conscious or dietary concerned, um, they make it easy for me to understand what my options might be. And so I think those are some really cool examples of how the simple fact of, you know, identifying, understanding and embracing me really unlocks a lot of other marketing strategies that will ultimately create higher future lifetime value as me, uh, for me as a customer yeah. and keep me coming back and spending more. Yeah. I, for one, love when I'm listened to, whether it's a survey sent to me after a transaction or, um, you know, if I go on looking for something and there's a live chat feature or even a two-way text message conversation, and I know there's a person on the other end of it, um, it's really helpful to be able to sort of, you know, I'm, I'm freely sharing a lot of information about myself and they're capturing a lot more detail about me. But at the same time, you know, they're going to make effective changes to their business and I'm going to continue to be loyal because they're listening. And it, it doesn't have to be big, expensive, heavy, complicated things that we're doing here, right? You think about Panera, you know, you get a cookie yeah. on your birthday. Like, what is that? Five cents, 10 cents of cost. But again, the, the impact it has on me as a person can be really resounding. And, and it, it just is a little piece that differentiates them from everybody else and might make me come back. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's little surprise and delight things that you can introduce into you know, a predicted journey or uh, along, a, a, you know, an anticipated purchase, I think is a really great way to enhance the experience and, and just kind of edge out the competition with those little moves. Because going back to something you were talking about earlier, Kat, is the, the idea of being human centered and, and the experience economy that we now live in, right? Having the best location and the lowest price and the best product aren't necessarily the leading indicators of future success as a company the way it once was, Correct. right? Consumers, especially as you move down the demographic, we'll drive farther. We'll spend more to get something that feels different. We're very sensory seeking as, mm -hmm. as a demographic, you know, and, you know, it, it, it really comes down to, I think the new competition is experience. It's not price and product as much as it once was. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, as we all know, it's it's a much less costly to retain business than to go out and try to find new business. Um, so all these things are really important. Yeah. All right. Next. So removing friction. Um, we all know the pandemic accelerated you know, the adoption of mobile and online ordering, curbside pickup, delivery. These have become so standard in the restaurant industry and customers are providing a ton of information about themselves in order to leverage these capabilities. So how do we use that information to remove friction, right? How do we pinpoint where or why customers are churning, um, how to anticipate their needs before they have to ask or hopefully before they leave? 40% um, of consumer spending is expected to be attributed to Gen Z this year. And I point that out because Gen Z is a very digital savvy generation. They have a really short attention span. Their expectations are speed and convenience, uh, maybe even DIY, right? They don't, they don't necessarily want to have to go inter interact with someone. Um, I think it's something like 57% of them prefer self-checkouts. Um, so that tells you, you know, am I making these available for my customers? You know, a DIY transaction costs a fraction less than having live service. So are we capitalizing on that? Um, and kind of just this idea of what used to be very time consuming can now be boiled down into efficient and frictionless um, transactions. And, and if we understand their preferences and their pain points, we can make it much simpler for them to transact, which makes it hopefully much more often that they're transacting with us. Um, but it also increases their appetite for loyalty, right? Because if they are, you know, if they're higher frequency and spending more, they're going to be interested in a loyalty program and willing to give you more information. Um, so are you making it easy enough to, to allow them to enroll, to earn, to redeem? Um, are they getting the same experience, you know, online versus in store? Generally, if they use more channels, they tend to be more valuable customers. So all of these are questions um, that we ask ourselves around. How are we making it a frictionless experience? Yeah, I think one of the gold standards <clears throat> as far as frictionless is concerned, and one of the early adopters of what, what I would consider truly frictionless transactions is Starbucks, right? We're all pretty familiar with, you know, first they had the mobile app, which is great, right? <clears throat> I got rewards and I, I could top up my card and, and have a digital checkout experience that was quicker, faster, easier. I could order on the app. Then they enabled me to order ahead and pick up in the store. 
which ties in a lot of really sophisticated technology, but creates a really great experience. And, you know, whether you love their coffee or not, you, you have to acknowledge the fact that they've really pushed the envelope on trying to maximize uh, the throughput for those stores because they're all very pretty small footprints as far as stores are concerned. And, you know, it, I, I don't know what the impact is to their bottom line or, or to their revenue, but I imagine the order on the way and pick up uh, is, is done great for them, not only uh, during the pandemic, but before the pandemic. So I think they were a very, very early, um, you know, uh, adopter of the concept of reducing friction, streamlining the experience, keeping the, the experience consistent, right? So, you know, you go into a Starbucks, you kind of know where things are and you know what the experience is going to be, which is huge because going back to the idea of human centered, the reptilian part of our brain, like some of the most, his, you know, antiquated parts of our brain uh, detect anxiety um, on, a, on a vastly different subconscious level. So when you think about what concerns us or what drives adoption or repels behavior, it's that fear, that anxiety of, I don't know what to expect, mm -hmm. right? So the more you can quell that sort of reptilian part of our brain that, that has that fight or flight component to it, the more you can kind of move that aside and make it very predictable. I know what I'm walking into. I know what this is going to feel like. I know what this is going to take. That reduces a different level of friction that isn't even on the surface, right? And I, I think that's just hugely powerful and has probably done a lot to contribute to the success of the McDonald's of the world and, and uh, you know, the Starbucks of the world that really focus on that standardized footprint, that standardized experience. Because you, you build business efficiencies, but you create really seamless, easy, fast-paced experiences for your consumers. And I, I just think that that's, can't be underscored enough as far as how to be human-centered. Yeah, it is paramount. Um, and I would say, too, not just with removing anxiety from the equation, but also sort of reminding them of that good emotion and that good interaction that they had with the brand, which will drive them to hopefully come back. I know, personally, my my you know most frictionless experience brand that i'm most loyal to is probably what many others are too is amazon um, which yeah. is a great example and you know they've learned my preferences they make it so incredibly easy for me there's you know i can purchase anything i want with a couple of, of you know punches of a button uh, it's all at my fingertips returns are extremely easy the pricing is decent you know there are options like try before you buy you know don't pay until you make sure that you like it you know again free returns with grocery delivery i don't even set foot into a grocery store anymore because i can do repeat orders i can schedule them i can get them same day um, extremely easy and, and efficient you know they'll come back and suggest products to me hey we know that you bought this you probably like this as well and i'm like great i didn't know you had that i'm gonna buy that too um, you know, subscribe and save is huge in my household. We, I, I got to a point where I'm buying this all the time. Amazon's made it easy now. They're like, go ahead and add this. We'll give you 15% off on top of that. So, you know, we have a huge delivery that arrives every month of things that we need. And that keeps me from going to the competitors. It keeps me, you know, a loyal Amazon shopper. I love them for it. I, I think the world of them and I continue to purchase from there. So, um, I mean, everything, right. I'm, I buy my books through Kindle and I have streaming services through Amazon video and we have in-home devices and wearables. And I mean, they've just really capitalized on knowing exactly who I am and making it extremely easy for me to, you know, find new things that I would like to purchase from them. It's a great example of a company that we can all relate to that are using every single one of these mm -hmm. strategies, right? In very different ways to create very different outcomes. Um, I would say it doesn't have an overwhelmingly personalized experience, meaning it doesn't feel like mm -hmm. I'm in my own store, but everything else is, is kind of ticking all of those boxes as far as, you know, creating something that makes it quick, easy, intelligent, thoughtful, um, and that drives some of the emotion that we have towards, you know, companies like Amazon. They're thinking about us. And I think that underscores another really key component of what loyalty means today. You know, the, the loyalty above the waterline, the spend X, get Y, for me to have any kind of differentiated experience or any benefit whatsoever, the onus was on me. Mm -hmm. I had to earn loyalty, right, with the brand. But that whole paradigm has shifted. It's now the responsibility of the brand to prove that they're loyal to me. 
because I'll take my money elsewhere because mm-hmm. with the internet and, and all kinds of other competition that are focusing on these types of strategies, um, it's very easy for me to have options to go somewhere else, to uh, engage somewhere else. So I think that the, the big change and the big draw behind loyalty and human-centered strategies and personalization and individualization, a lot of the, the concepts that are out there in the market right now are all derived from that concept that, you know, again, it's coming back to experience. Whoever has the best experience is probably going to win my business long term. Yeah. And we'll get back to this a little later with the data, but, you know, Amazon has invested a lot in capturing, you know, a ton of data on all of us, but it has served them very, very well. Um, So, you know, from from an operator perspective, you know, where and how do you invest to keep up with these trends? Um, and, And we'll get back to that. But yeah, Amazon is, in my mind, they're not a retailer as much as they are a technology company. 100%. Mm-hmm. All right. Next, know what I care about. So as we just stated, traditional loyalty focuses on savings or discounts, but it's really hard to develop a deep relationship with a customer based on that alone. Um, it's not going to be always about a discount or a price for people. Um, 76% of customers expect brands to understand their needs and expectations. So they want you to use the data that they're giving you to understand what matters to them. Um, and they're going to spend more for what they perceive as valuable. They want to be informed. So is you, you know, is your food farm to table? Do you use recycled materials? Um, I remember recently Kava asked as I was placing an order, do you want utensils? You know, they're trying to be environmentally friendly. We don't want to put things in your order that you're not going to use. Um, that's, that's valuable for me to know that. Um, perhaps the customer wants information on allergens or you know, dietary specific offerings. Um, or are we communicating in line with dietary preferences, with timing preferences, with um, you know, channel propensities? Do we, are we recognizing the customer's status with the brand? And then you know, with all of this, how do we leverage machine learning to really understand this customer better and to send targeted and, and relevant offers to people? Um, you know, back to my Amazon example earlier, I just recently learned that I think it's called Amazon Smile, will donate a portion of my spend to my favorite charity, my favorite animal charity, um, with every purchase that I make. And so now I'm even more enthused about spending money there because I'm really passionate about that. And that's something that matters to me. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, when, when you think about what people care about, you know, we're all individuals, right? And at the end of the day, we're all striving towards kind of a segment of one right? That's what I want. I want to be looked at as the individual I am and engaged because of who I am and how I behave. For a marketer, even with technology, that can be really, really daunting. So you end up as a marketer trying to communicate to five or six personas, you know, these massive segments of people that really don't have that sort of personal touch, you know, but to get from, you know, tens of millions of customers that all sit within one of these six segments, all the way down to a segment of one is, is difficult. And you can't get there without investment in technology and building out you know, a technology pipeline that enables your marketers to quicker, faster, get to that level of individuality. And personalization, I think, is a concept that's driving towards that. But really, the new trend is individualization, right? I'm not a person. I'm an individual. And there's a nuance there that has kind of an emotional component to it. That can't be underscored. And I think we've talked a little bit about a lot of those drivers as we've kind of navigated, you know, these slides that sort of unpack the philosophy of what loyalty means today. And hopefully giving you some examples of how you could interpret that maybe in context of your own business or your own customer base. But at the end of the day, understanding the individual and knowing what that individual cares about will help you predict their behavior, drive their behavior and create incrementality in those desired behaviors, whether those are transactions, whether it's average order value, category spend, frequency, engagement, you know, it's something as simple as the communications you send to me. You know, I can't tell you how many brands that I've unsubscribed from because it's just like every day, it's something, Mm -hmm. something. And that starts to lose relevance to me. It starts to become Mm -hmm. noise. And I know they're spending a ton of money to try and engage me, but they don't even know what what I'm engaging with. So there has to be that feedback loop of understanding what am I clicking on? What am I engaging on? um, And and how to leverage that so that you give me more of that information so that you're increasing my engagement. But these are challenges you can't solve without technology. Absolutely. And then last piece of this puzzle, 
adding value. So again, this is not one loyalty program anymore, right? It's one tailored loyalty program for each customer. Um, and in addition to sort of providing discounts, um, can we offer you know, privileges or benefits? Um, is there some kind of exclusivity that's appealing? Um, I might not always be after a discount as a customer. I might be happy paying more for something if I believe that the benefit is valuable to me. Um, say that there are you know, perks that you can offer, VIP parking spaces or small freebies that you might give um, people who frequent your establishment or reach a certain tier. You know, do I have a gold status? Do you want to send me a message about it that makes me feel um, you know, singled out and um, like I have you know, some kind of a, a higher status and achievement with you? Any examples, Andy, you can think of here with, with companies that add value really well? Yeah, you know, I think there there are, I mean, uh, Amazon, one of your favorites, I think does an excellent job of adding value, right? You know, the simple recommendation of people that bought this, bought that, maybe it gives you something that you hadn't contemplated as part of that purchase that you're like, oh yeah, I do need that. Thank you. Right. That didn't cost them anything. Um, it didn't give me any discount, but it did make my life a little bit better. And it did add value to that experience because I didn't think I needed a wall mount for the TV I'm buying. Yeah. Right. So it's just those little things like that, that kind of connect dots for the consumer that do add value, both literally and figuratively. Yeah. Right. It adds value to the order I'm placing, but it also adds value because you thought of me and you maybe made a recommendation I hadn't thought of yet. So I, I think that's a really good example, personally. Yep, absolutely. So those are our core components. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Andy. Yeah. So, you know, the underlying theme is, well, okay, guys, this sounds great, right? Yeah. I love it. H how do I do it? Right. My environment is really, really contemplated, uh, com complicated. You know, I, I am making an assumption that we have some marketers and some operators and some technologists on this call. So, you know, one of the things that I like to start off with is I, I find this cartoon a little bit funny, right? Now that we've invested in all this MarTech stack, what's the ROI? Um, I think that's, that's kind of snarky, but true to life, right? Uh, technology's changed significantly in the last 15 to 20 years. And uh, even as technology companies, we're trying to keep up with technology. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, you know, companies that are over a decade old have a, an ecosystem problem where you've added these little point solutions along the way that made sense, at that point in time, but now 10 years later, you don't even know where your customer is, right? You've got data on this customer spread out all over the place. And, you know, you're asking your marketer to go put together a target list of an audience. And it's very difficult for them to know where to go and how to pull those attributes in because they're ordering online and they're picking up in store and they're ordering this way and that way on this day and that day. And so it becomes really, really complicated when you're talking about how to bring this all back to Andy the individual, and how do I engage him with any of the strategies or concepts that we just threw out? So to transition into a technical conversation, and I'll, I'll, we'll keep it relatively high level, uh, you need a system that has consolidation built into it, right? I need to be able to systematically shed some of these systems, reduce the redundancy, streamline the data collection, and then make that data actionable. Right? It's one thing to collect it and get that 360 degree view of all the things I'm doing behaviorally, transactionally, engagement wise. There's all these events and data footprints that I'm leaving all over your brand. Bring that back to Andy, the individual. So, you know, we're pulling the data from point of sale and from e com and from mobile, and we're engaging the consumer through email and SMS and MMS and direct mail and other channels. And all that data is being pushed and pulled back through an events engine that enables all that infinite flexibility and future proofs this entire strategy. Because I couldn't tell you which engagement channels most popular next or, you know, what retail opportunity or, or uh, you know, technology stack uh, option might be invented in the next three to five years. So you need something that's really future proof. So Having a stack that looks like this is quintessential. It's critical to being able to execute on any of the things that we talked about. So having that customer data platform that gives you the single view of the individual, having the ability to deploy stored value solutions, you know, gift cards and merchandise credits and comp cards and, and all of those other uh, great financial tools that help with acquisition and retention in different ways, 
um, be, are now part of an overall strategy. So I can have, you know, my declining balance card in line with all the offers that I've unlocked or that you want to present to me, as well as any loyalty perks and privileges and benefits and rewards and discounts that I might be eligible for, whether it's item-based or order-based or time-sensitive, all of that decorating that single profile. And it's now all actionable. And then underneath of that, uh, having the, the machine learning that the marketers are in desperate need of that is productized and uh, intuitive that enables them to um, remove all the haystacks and just build a pile of needles, right? That's really what we're looking to do is stop playing with the hay. You know, we need to go get needles and, and that's really where the platform is focused on helping enable these marketers to get to. And then ultimately to act on all of that, right? It's great to consolidate the data, but then how do you form uh, a, a campaign that gives Kat what she wants and gives me what I want? You know, demographically, we're a little bit different, but our behaviors uh, within the brand might be very similar. We clearly both like the color blue, um, you know, so we have that commonality and in, 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 uh, we have that in common, but that might be where our commonalities end. So as a marketer, I want to increment Kat's behavior and I want to increment Andy's behavior. So let the, sh let the machine kind of make some of those decisions in a way that's more accurate uh, and faster and, and less biased. Yeah. And, and I think with, you know, the struggles that we're facing post pandemic and, you know, especially today with operators facing, you know, supply and labor shortages and, you know, higher food costs, lower margins, um, more competition. I think it, it's become really critical you know, in order to, to drive the business and, you know, drive the income that we need to sort of understand the customer better, you know, have a solution, you know, a MarTech stack that you can can really manage well. Because I think something like 58% of, of, or what is it, marketers are using 58% of their full tech stacks capabilities. So we may have all of these things that we've invested in, but we're not utilizing them well, or we want to invest in them, but we're afraid we're not going to get the ROI that we need. Um, but in order to grow and to, to sort of um, get past the struggles that we're facing right now in the industry, you have to adapt to consumer preferences, right? You have to invest in the right technology to help you automate that, um, to reduce your operational costs and to really, um, you know, drive that sustainable income. There's not going to be a sort of human way to do it without technology. Totally agree. Yeah. All right. So when you think about the strategy and, and how does it work from a systems architecture, from a data flow perspective, this will kind of give you an idea of what that loop looks like. So, you know, on, on this part of the slide, we have first party data. That's data coming from your point of sale, from your website, from your mobile app, uh, from your marketing channels, if you're able to get some of those signals back. Uh, a lot of more contemporary brands are also augmenting that data. So they're going out and acquiring data on me or Kat, uh, which there's plenty of data out there on us that you can go buy to inform or decorate uh, either our profile or to inform segmentation. But all that sits within that profile. That, that, that lives inside the, the customer data platform itself. Segmentation is automated. So it's going to move people around in segments as they meet or fail to meet the conditions of that segment as, as you, the marketer or the operator have defined them. The segments I sit in uh, will dictate which campaigns or offers that I'm eligible for. The machine learning will decide of those options, which one are most likely uh, uh, to convert It'll determine which the best channel to communicate that to. Maybe Kat, uh, at this time of day, email is best for her. But this time of day for me, SMS is the best channel based on conversions and everything else that we're seeing. It'll then personalize the offer. And then we see what happens. The system will constantly look for those behaviors to be exhibited after the engagement has been delivered. And Again, because we're not looking at, at customers through the lens of loyalty exclusively, we're looking at all consumers, right? I might be a, a guest of yours uh, for two or three years, and I might shop there religiously every week for two to three years before I finally opt into your loyalty program. So you don't want to start the conversation there. You want to see me for those two to three years and through all those transactions and optimize my behavior and engage my, uh, my, my personality uh, in a way that that get some of that incrementality until I then, uh, you know, eclipse uh, the, the hurdle of enrolling in your program. And now I unlock all this differentiated activity that I'm eligible for. So 
Again, the strategy isn't about just your loyalty customers. It's all of your customers because anyone that dines with you more than once has loyalty. It's your job as the business to aggregate that or to, to, uh, you know, um, to drive that behavior forward. But then ultimately, how did it work out for the guest? Was it positive? Was it negative? Was it neutral? What was the ROI? And all that data then feeds back into the CDP. It updates the customer profile. It updates the segmentation, opens up new offers, creates new communications. And now we have this closed loop sequence of events that are playing out off of the stack that's ultimately driving a lot of this marketing strategy. And then the machine learning is what accelerates the, the uh, circuit. It accelerates the cycling um, of consumers and guests through uh, this closed loop strategy. Yeah. So this is ultimately the building blocks for how you take uh, the business from where it is today to a human-centered business using you know, a Marcom stack and uh, your core commerce engine as the primary driver to engage that consumer uh, and, and get them moving forward in a, in a more attractive, margin-friendly, uh, and, and revenue-generating kind of way. And again, to sort of, you know, um, compare this with the traditional loyalty program, you would set that up and sort of forget it. You know, that's your program. With this, it's all real time. It's interactive. You know, your customers' preferences are changing. They're interacting with the brand. You're getting more data all the time. And that's being fed back into the feedback loop. So if there's, you know, something that you've tried, some campaigns that you run that, you know, didn't go too well, or you just didn't get the ROI you thought you would, it's very easy to change it and very easy for it to sort of machine learn and, and automate itself as well. Um, so that's the beauty of this of this technology. So some key takeaways. Um, obviously, we want to personalize any kind of program you're running, whether it's a loyalty program uh, or a rewards program or just a membership club. You know, creating that that individuality and and that exclusivity is a really important part of the strategy. Uh, you want to aggregate the data. We need to bring it all in from all the touch points, both the commerce side and the marketing side to understand what's moving the needle for this person, for this segment, for my, for my business. And then automate that. I, I think automation can't be underscored enough as far as one of the key drivers of why technology is so relevant. You know, the automation of decision, the, automative, the automation of execution, the automation of reporting, all of that is absolutely critical because... Marketers' budgets are shrinking, but their KPIs are growing. So it's getting really, really difficult as a marketer to figure out what shots to take, what strategies to run. So we need to lean on the ML side of the business to help us understand what the right decisions are and where the best ROI is. And then part of the output of all of that is increasing the relevance, right? At the end of the day, we want less noise, more value. So I think that's a really critical part of the equation here as well. Ultimately, all this relies on the ability to track the behavior to begin with. And that's part of the strategy of loyalty as a program. Uh, because as a, as a guest that opts into your loyalty program, I'm giving you um, all the latitude you need to track my information and to use that to better my experience. And part of the value exchange between enabling you to track all of my behaviors is the perk or privilege or the benefit or the reward or the discount or the experience that I'm getting on the back end of you having access to that data. Mm -hmm. So again, it all comes back to understanding those behaviors and being able to normalize all of that data back into an actionable marketing platform. So when you think about, you know, the best way to do this, absolutely time has, has proven that we can build these types of strategies and execute these types of technology systems by stringing together a lot of best in breed platforms out there, which there are plenty of. But for many of us, we're seeking consolidation. We're seeking fewer vendors, deeper relationships, um, less complexity, less tech uh, reliance post implementation. So having an all in one technology partner that can consolidate all of these strategies and systems into something that's battle hardened. Uh, that's flexible uh, and that can grow with you, whether it's in sophistication or scale or global footprint or otherwise, uh, is, is a key takeaway in terms of how are we as marketers going to deliver on a human-centered strategy. Yeah, 
And that's a really important point too, is, is that it's a, something that's scalable, right? That'll grow with me so that in five years, I don't have to reinvest in new or different technology or add to my stack. Um, and you said something too, uh, to me, Andy, that's, you know, sounds ironic, but we, you know, in order to get really human centered with every guest, we need technology. <laughs> I mean, and that's the kind of the, the base, the core of the need is data. Um, and so whether you're leveraging, you know, a bunch of solutions and, and integrating all of them or, or one solution, um, you need to be able to identify, to understand and to motivate that guest, but it has to be technology that is simple enough to manage without constant, you know, manual administration of all of the pieces, because that's something that, you know, operators today really can't, can't do easily. All right. Um, with that, we thank you for listening and hopefully we can answer some questions. Thanks for the insight. So we're going to turn it over to our Q&A. And our first question is that, um, get, so getting this data is key. Operators are having difficulty with Uber, with the Uber Eats and the DoorDashes of the world as they control that customer data. Mm. Any secrets on helping operators sway the user to order directly from them, say, next time so that the data stays local? You yeah, I, yeah, no, I, I mean, from, from my vantage point, I, I think um, offering concepts like loyalty or exclusive offers, you know, in the retail side of the world, uh, there's a lot of channel challenge, right? You know, you've got people who are predominantly e-com shoppers and, you know, that, that can be a challenge if you're a store operator because you, you need to drive traffic to the store as well. So offering or, or extending offers that are only redeemable at your local store is a great way to kind of change behavior, shift behavior, and start to drive guests uh, into the physical store. I know this is a little bit different. Uh, so DoorDash and, and Uber Eats uh, and some of those players out there, they do control that customer data. And that can be a challenge if you're a brand that's trying to understand who is this and, and, you know, how do we, how do we enable them to have a better experience uh, in concert with the Uber Eats and the DoorDashes? We don't have to compete. We just want to be able to inform the experience. So I might be someone who have dined via DoorDash dozens of times and now I'm in proximity to a store and I walk in and I want that personalized experience, but it's not there because you can't connect the dots. So there, there's definitely a challenge there with, with some of those business models, but I would think, you know, a loyalty program is obviously a great way to incentivize um, proprietary channel purchasing, um, you know, channels that you own and control. I think that's a great way. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and just to add to that, I, I do believe, you know, coming soon or, or recently developed, they are starting to share some of that data. So I've seen a couple of them now um, ask as you place an order, it'll say, you know, can we share your data with third party? And so we may in the future be able to get some of that data. But I think, you know, to Andy's point for now, I respond as a, as a consumer very well to even offers and coupons that say must be redeemed in store. Great, I'll go in store. Probably haven't been in store before, but if I go in and I have a good experience and I'm part of a loyalty program and you recognize me, you know, I'll probably come back. Okay. Is MMS or multimedia messaging services, especially in food service, growing? I would think there's a pretty picture of a plate of food or a nice beverage on ice. That seems like a no-brainer. Um, any statistics versus SMS? Yes. Um, so with, with MMS, it's, it's a little more expensive as far as a delivery uh, to deliver that message, but it's much, much richer content. Uh, so I would, I would keep the MMS targeted towards either my, um, most fiercely loyal or my highest value customers or those that have the highest value potential. Um, because it, it is incrementally more expensive than SMS and other channels that said it's efficacy is way higher. Um, I I've seen stats that it's three to five times higher in conversion than SMS and, and somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20% higher than that of email. So it is definitely a richer engagement medium. Uh, it's just more expensive. So there's kind of a pro con checks and balances aspect that you'd want to take before you start deploying a bunch of, of MMS as part of a strategy, but it is a, a, a more rich experience. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, some of the you know, marketing research um, in, in recent years has been pointing to more visual, right? Things that take less time, um, you know, video, audio, uh, multimedia clips, things like that. I think in, in with food, it's especially motivating, right? To see the food. Um, it's the whole different sort of feeling that you get rather than someone just talking about it. Um, so I think they're especially important. There are a lot of customers leveraging it today um, in the hospitality segment. And so it, it is growing, I would say for sure. Um, you know, but to Andy's point, you can segment and choose who you want to send messages to um, and, and really create and build that value in the ROI there. Okay. If a restaurant brand wants to move from transactional loyalty to creating human-centered experiences, what infrastructure or technology do they need to make this transition easier? I, I So from my vantage point, if we're in a baby step, uh, our way into it from kind of a legacy sort of antiquated uh, or legacy sort of technical stack. I think, you know, having consistency across your point of sale is really important, right? When you've got disparate systems at your commerce uh, engine, it's, it's really difficult to manage that because some of those systems create data or manage data in different ways. So you need to kind of clean up that side of the business, but then ultimately having all of the data that's flowing from those commercial engines into that central data hub, in this case, the customer data platform, will unlock a lot of reporting value, uh, a lot of insights. Uh, it'll open up the ability to do some very sophisticated segmentation work um, that doesn't require technology to, to, uh, a technologist to do. As a marketer, you can go in and kind of set the criteria of, of, of segment. I think that's kind of the first step in that in that equation, um, then I think it's it you know it's it's a matter of who is your brand, what is your average order value, what is your frequency. I think those are primary drivers in determining what's the next angle or what's the next avenue I should exploit first, so I can get the low hanging fruit and get that revenue generating uh, in the right direction, so that I can fund some of the more longer term uh, types of strategies. So offer optimization is a really great way to kind of lean in quick and drive incremental value fast. Whereas loyalty, you're not gonna bolt it on today and see 10X transactions tomorrow, right? Loyalty has to bake as a strategy for a little while. So it's got a bit of a, a longer arc to it versus offer management, you can start generating smart offers tomorrow. So that that's a, a critical sequence I would lean in on. Yeah, I think a couple of, of great points there of really starting out with knowing your brand, um, I would say is, is extremely important. And, and not just that, but having all of your stakeholders understand the strategy and be part of that same sort of cohesive strategy, um, you know, whether it's your technology leaders, your marketing leaders, operations, everybody being on the same page um, and then understanding, you know, what do we need to get to our ultimate goal? Um, do we have the right tech in place? And then if not, you know, what technology solution is going to provide, you know, that end-to-end -end experience that we're looking for? What is the most seamless and easy way to do it, right? Work smart, not hard. I think that's very critical. So if a brand has had a loyalty program for a while, but wants to get below that surface of the tip of the loyalty iceberg and move into those true one-to-one -one type experiences, where do they start? What's the most important thing that they need to do first? Kat, do you want to take that one first? Or? Yeah. I mean, I would say, again, understanding, you know, assessing your tech stack, right? Start with, with taking inventory. Um, you know, what, what do you have today? What data are you collecting? What are you able to do? What, you know, look at some of the reporting and data that you're getting and then measure that against um, some of your goals um, and maybe the KPIs that you want to hit. Um, and I, you know, from there would say, you know, make sure you're considering, you know, the whole frictionless experience, right? Do we, do we have all the pieces in place to support, you know, edge integrations and, and everything else we might want to look to. Um, and then, you know, if, if you don't have all the answers, partner with someone who does and, you know, work towards ultimately those end goals. Yeah. Well put. Okay. Are there any real life examples of brands that are doing this well and the business outcomes that are driving these as a result? Who's doing this well and, and how are they doing it? I can think of one of my favorite, another one of my favorites. Um, I frequent Panera Bread a lot and I did even before they had all of the perks that they have today. Um, I initially liked the brand because they had flexible, healthy options. You can mix and match. I can get a salad and a soup or a soup and, and they're smaller portions. So I don't have to buy the full portion of both things. Um, and then they had rewards, which is great. 
you know, to encourage, you know, frequency, I started getting a few dollars back in discounts here and there. But lately, you know, as the environments become more competitive and more brands are getting my attention, I'm still frequenting Panera. And it's usually because the sort of speed and ease of use, I really like that I can walk into a kiosk, um, order what I want, the order accuracy is, is going to be on point because I ordered it myself. Um, I, they have self-serve drink stations. I can get whatever I want. I can mix and match if I want. Um, the wait time is shorter. I, I, you know, I don't have to be there very long. If I want to place an order from the app and just run in and pick it up, I can do that. Um, and I also noticed recently they've got a subscription. So if you're going in and having drinks from Panera every day, I can join there. I think it's like sip club or something like that. Um, but you pay a subscription fee and don't have to pull out my wallet. Don't have to do anything, get, get unlimited drinks. And while I'm there, a lot of times I'm probably going to eat as well. So they're yeah. capitalizing on that. Um, I think they even offer a free trial with it. Um, and of course, just in general, you know, Panera has sort of learned who their customer is, right? I'm a working professional. I come in typically by myself and I just need a coffee or, you know, a small snack. They've got laptop friendly tables with charging stations. They offer free Wi-Fi, And to get that free Wi-Fi, I'm giving them my data. Um, and I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it's making it very worth it for them, but also for me, as a customer to know that there's somewhere I can go that, you know, every location is the same, the consistency is there, whether the app or in store. Um, I think they're doing it really, really well. Yeah. I think Panera is smart um, because they're combining a lot of things, you know, typically they're a larger footprint, larger format than some of their competitors and they encourage the linger time. The seats are a little more comfortable. The tables are a little bigger yeah. and the longer they linger, as a guest, the more likely they are to get the, you know what, maybe I will get a cookie. Maybe I will get a muffin. Maybe I will get this. Maybe I will stay for lunch. Right. And I think that is to your point, a really compelling sub strategy within sort of the broader marketing engagement strategies. How do I take what I already have invested in and incorporate that into a human centered experience, which requires some thought um, and some luck in some, in some regards, you know, there, there's no secret sauce to loyalty. There's a lot of trial and error aspects to it as you're looking to optimize the behaviors you're trying to exhibit uh, or drive. And that that also speaks to the technology side. You don't want something that's rigid and per overly prescriptive in terms of what you can and can't do with it because your strategy has to change. Loyalty can't be the same program forever. It has to evolve. Otherwise, people will learn how to game it to their own advantage or they'll just get disengaged by it because it becomes predictable. Right. You know, that's the nuance of who we are. We want predictability subconsciously, but consciously that's boring. Right. So like there's this balance of creating predictability as far as the experience. But as far as like some of the strategies we're deploying as marketers, having some surprise and delight, having some unforeseen experiences um, that are positive happen uh, or even the ability to interject when a negative experience happens as a guest. Right. How do you have strategies that win them back and make them, you know, recapture the emotion in an otherwise negative emotion and experience? And I think there's a lot of appeasements that we didn't talk about here that, that play out in in hospitality, but across all verticals. When I don't have a good experience, what now, especially when I'm highly loyal? Exactly. And I think it goes back to sort of traditional loyalty of us sending offers to anyone, even if they were going to come in the next day anyway, we're giving them offers that really we didn't necessarily have to give them versus now we can, you know, set up these segments and, and set up campaigns to know if, if, you know, Kat was unhappy during her last visit, let's send her an offer, uh, make sure that we can, you know, keep this guest versus sending offers blanketed to everyone. Um, it, it just it's, it becomes a lot easier and a lot more um, of a smart way to do offers and loyalty. Okay. Well, we'd like to thank our viewers for joining us. And thanks to Catherine and Andy for their time. Thank you both. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. We'll see you next time. Thanks a bunch. Bye-bye. Thanks, folks. Yeah.